So we are on page uh, 283. Um, when you came in to class today, I'm sure you noticed your FRQ on your desk. Um, begin looking over that. We are going to do a little bit with your FRQ on Friday. I probably am going to give you some time on Friday to develop it and write it. I'm going to give you helpful hints on Friday as well. Remember on Thursday, the plan is for you to do your chapter eight content posters. They will be the mini posters. So you'll fill out the front, you'll fill out the back. That will be your homework for Thursday night. And then you're, you're actually gonna turn those in um, <clears throat> to me first thing on Friday morning. So at eight o'clock, I know your class starts at 8.05. At 8 o'clock on Friday, you will just bring that to my office, okay, and turn that in to me. Not before 8 o'clock, at 8 o'clock. Because I, I think the bell rings at 7.55, right, when you come upstairs. So before you go to your first period on Friday, you'll turn in your um, content poster, okay? So you will have time on Thursday um, to work on that uh, Chapter 8 content poster. And that is going to be a homework grade, so you are getting... Um, so what's the what's the cha with the title of this chapter? Um, Rachel, what's the title of this chapter? Um, oh boy. Oh, I can see. I mean, no, that's a long chapter. Ah, Steph. Yes, political geography. All right, someone else give me one concept that uh, we have just touched on. You don't need to tell me about it. Just one concept. Nation state. Nation state. Okay. Something else. Peyton. Shapes of states. Say again. Shapes of states. Shapes of states. Yes. We talked about that yesterday. Different boundaries. <clears throat> Different boundaries. Good. The law of the sea. The law of the sea. Good, Sarah. Multi-ethnic states. Yes. Multi-ethnic states. Anything else? Multinational states. <coughs> All right. So we talked talked about quite a bit. All right, we're jumping into 18. Uh, these are definitions. I'm going to give this to Steph. I'm going to have you do 18 and 19. Just straight definitions. Define unitary state. Define federal state. A unitary state is a state where most power is in the hands of central government officials. And a federal state is a locate strong power to unit of local government within the country. Okay, now Follow me on this. I want to connect a couple terms. Because yesterday we talked about the term democracy. And we talked about the term autocracy. Remember that? Democracy and autocracy. What type of country is the United States? Democracy. democracy. What type of country is China? Autocracy. autocracy. Okay, good. So we're, we're good there. Now, let me ask you this. These two terms, unitary state and federal state, what state, unitary state, would it be an autocracy or a democracy? Autocracy. Say it again, Jay. Autocracy. Okay, you said autocracy. Why? Uh, because it states uh, where the most power is in central government. It's not really more of the people's choice. They don't it, really get in that. Exactly. That's exactly right, Jay. The key word there is where most power is in the hands of central government officials. So I want you to put just in parentheses, by unitary state, this would be a type of autocracy. Okay, and we talked about countries that are autocratic, right? You mentioned North Korea. You mentioned Iran. You mentioned China. What's another country Actually, I was thinking about this this morning. Really close to us, that would be a unitary state or an autocracy. Really close to us. Cuba. Cuba, right? Cuba is communist. So Cuba would be an example of a unitary state or autocracy. Does everybody see the connection of unitary state and autocracy? Yes, no? Okay, very clear. Same thing here by process of elimination. Federal state is a type of what? Democracy. Go ahead and put that in parentheses then, right? Because strong power to units of local government within the country. So 
what does local government signify? What does that mean? That means that power is in the hands of you, your parents, and me. Now, when you're talking about government, there are three different types of government today. You have federal, okay? Federal would be national, all right? Our federal government is where today? Washington, D.C., okay? Under the federal, we then have state. We have state government. Our state government is currently where? Tallahassee. Tallahassee, exactly. Wherever the state capital is, that's where your state officials go and represent us. But then, and this is what's so important, the third level of government today within political geography is local. Now here's the cool thing, class. This little model that I put up for you, most countries today in the world that are democracies follow this little model. They have the federal government, they have the state government, and they have the local government. Now, our local government is where? What's the main city in the county? I didn't mean this to be hard. What's the main city in Lee County? The biggest city. I heard someone say it. Say it louder. What's the largest city in Lee County? Where do you live? Where? Fort Myers. Fort Myers. Fort Myers. Right. There's a lot of cities, right? There's a lot of cities in Lee County. Estero, Bonita Springs, Lehigh Acres. Um, help me with others. Tampa? No. No, 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 no. I, I'm not thinking today. Tampa is not in the county. What about Arcadia and this gracious? Um, the, what, no, not Arcadia. Um, oh, North Fort Myers. Myers, right. North Fort Myers, um, Astero. These are all cities that are in Lee County. The largest county, or the largest city in Lee County is Fort Myers. So that's where a lot of our county officials, our local officials, work. They work in Fort Myers because that's our largest. So very, very important democracy, and there are several examples of that. All right, number 20 and 21, I'm going to give to James. Uh, James number 20 says, regarding unitary states, what are three characteristics that tend to favor it for a country? And then number 21, where are unitary states most common? All right, so I said that the characteristics um, that tend to favor it for a country would be few internal differences, strong national unity, and smaller states. And then I said, what do you mean? Or I said, unis no. unitary states are most common in Europe. Okay, good. I want you to star both of those. Obviously, you're highlighting the two definitions, but number 20 and 21 are very important. Usually, smaller states are open to having unitary um, because there's not as many people. Number 22, multinational states often adopt unitary systems. For what reason? Also describe an example of where this has occurred. Multinational states. Enter what do you have for 22? Um, I don't know if this is right, but I said that like the values of a nationality are like pushed on another one. So like in Rwanda and Kenya, there's like an ethnic group that's like dominant. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Multinational, remember, one ethnicity is forced on everyone else. And so the unitary state, because it's in the central government, they're run by the majority. So they force that on everyone else. Okay, that, that should make sense. Number 23, Jackson, why is the federal state system more effective for larger states? The capitals are maybe more remote to provide effective control over other regions. Very good, okay. Um, go ahead and underline that is where it is with because the national capital may be too far remote to provide um, effective control of over other regions. All right, pretty important there on 23. 
All right, let's look at uh, 24 through 27. And this is the chart. Now, for some reason, the picture did not load, but some of you may need to add. I know your chart on this, some of yours was a little light in terms of information. So I would definitely recommend adding to that uh, to make sure you have this content for uh, the exam. All right, uh, number 24 and 25. Peyton, I'm gonna give this to you. Let's let me read the questions first and you can answer. 24 lists good examples of federal states that fulfill these conditions rather well. And then number 25, why has tiny Belgium adopted a federal system? Examples would include the United States, Russia, Canada, Brazil, and India. And Belgium has adopted a federal state system to accommodate the two cultural groups. Right. Now, and, and what are the two, and we talked about this last chapter in chapter seven, what were the two groups? Do you remember from last chapter? Flemings and the Wallonians. Yeah, the Wallonia or the Walloons and the Flemish. Why would Belgium go with a unitary system? Remember, um, the Flemish and the Walloons don't like each other. Remember, there's cultural differences. So they go with a federal system so that they don't have a civil war. Because if they went with the unitary system, the Flemish would be in control. The Walloons would not have a voice. So that's why they go with the federal system in Belgium, even though it's one of the smallest European countries. Rachel, how about number 26? Why has enormous China adopted a unitary system? Uh, so that they can promote communist values. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, it's very, very straightforward. They can continue to promote communist values, um, it's very easy. Where's all power in China centered? Beijing. Say again? Beijing. Yeah, Beijing. It's centered in the Communist Party, which is headquartered in Beijing, the capital of China. All right, so let's look at number 27. 27 is a real good example of this little model that I gave you up here on the board. Federal, state, and local. France is a good example of this. All right, so describe the internal political organization of France. If you kind of use this model right here that I showed you on the board, that may help you understand the data that you see here with France. So what is this saying? They have a strong national government that makes a lot of decisions across the country, okay? I'll ask you this, the capital of France is? Paris. So the national government, okay, the legislature, the prime minister of France, they all are located in Paris. Okay, that's where their headquarters are. But then you got to go out from there. Do they have state government? Do they have local government? Let's see. 96 local government departments with elected general counsel and appointed prefect. That's one person, okay? You may want to put a little parentheses there. An appointed prefect is just a fancy word for a leader, okay? It's usually one person. So local governments, they have 96 local government departments throughout France that report to the national government. Then this is crazy. Think about this. Over 36,600 local communes with an elected mayor and council. So if you look at the little picture, you see how France is broken up? Is the picture colored, by the way? It's not just, it's gray, gray and white. Well, you see how France is broken up. Every country is broken up differently. Okay, the United States is broken up differently. We're broken up by states, and then within the states, we have little regions. Okay, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. In France, they break it up a little differently. They don't necessarily have state government, they just have national and local, All right? And then you have the 22 regional councils that are elected 
and can raise taxes. Actually, I misspoke. These regional councils would probably be like your state government in the United States. Okay? To give you an example, regions in France, that would be, if you were trying to compare that to the United States, that would be like saying the region of Florida, Georgia, Alabama. Okay, like a true state region. Okay, that's kind of what you're looking at when you, um, you look at, at France. All right, so this is just an example of how government is broken up within one country. Okay, um, and the good thing for you is by the time you graduate ECS, you're going to learn about the government makeup within this country. Mrs. Leach teaches that course your senior year, American Government, which you will learn about the whole makeup of the political structure in the United States of America. Okay, let's look at uh, 28 through 32 here. All right, let's talk about some of these. Now, 28, um, Sarah, I'll give you 28 and 29, but I'm going to read these questions one at a time. Okay, but I'm going to have you answer 20 and 29. Why are boundaries and legislative districts occasionally redrawn? And before she answers this, I want you to highlight this question. This is really, really important because we are going to be going through this this year, actually. State legislatures do this. So this is really important that we understand what's going on. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, the boundaries are redrawn to, to make sure each district has the same population. Okay. Now, I want you to add this last sentence here. If you don't have this, this process occurs every 10 years. I want you to add that. This process occurs every 10 years. Isn't this interesting? Why every 10 years? Well, it's just because of the census, exactly. So this redrawing of district lines will not actually occur again until when? 20... 30... 2031. So 10 years from now, what, if you're 14 now, you'll be 24. If you're 15, you'll be 25. This process, now does anybody know, I will be so impressed. You know what, I'm feeling really good today. I need to give some extra credit for this. I don't expect you to know this, because this is a really challenging question. Do you know what this process is called? know what that the process of redrawing legislative district lines in states do you know what that's called I didn't think you would know but when I write it out some of you may not may have heard of this before okay it's something called re Reapportionments. Have any of you heard of that? Be honest with me. You have? You've heard of that? I've heard of this. Yeah. All right. So, that's pretty good odds. Last year I didn't, I only had one. Okay. It, it's not a term that we talk about in here. It's going to be something you'll learn more about in, in government. But, it's something called reapportionment. Now, why is it important for a political party to have control of the state legislature? You may have an idea. Why is it important for Democrats or Republicans to have control of a state government? Because every 10 years, the party in power controls the redrawing of the lines. 
Guess who is in control right now in Florida? The Republicans. So, Republicans, sometime this year, when our state legislature convenes, they will be in charge of redrawing the lines to accurately depict the results of the census. Now, here's something very interesting, and I'm not going to get into this, but you've heard of the Electoral College. Okay, you're going to talk more about that. The cool thing about it, the Electoral College, did you know this? This is a little known fact. Every 10 years with the census, people leave certain states and they move to other states. So some states have an influx of new residents, and other states lose people. So guess what happens? Some states get more regions, and they get more representatives. Other states have less regions and less representatives. So Florida, because so many people are moving to Florida, Florida actually could have a few new districts. And we could increase from 29 electoral votes, what we currently have, we could go up to 31 electoral votes. Because so many people are moving from other states and they're coming to Florida. Very interesting, this whole redrawing of lines. Sarah, the next question, how is this type of boundary redrawing different in the U.S. than in Europe? This type of boundary is different because in Europe, um, can't read my handwriting. Uh, <laughs> it says it's it's run independently. Um, commissions that create homogeneous regions. Okay. Um, everybody, <laughs> underline this. Okay, this is a very important question. In the U.S., boundary redrawing is done by state legislatures. Very simple to understand. State legislature. So what's the capital in Georgia? Atlanta. 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 All right. Atlanta right now is controlled by Republicans. Alabama. What's the capital of Alabama? Montgomery. 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 Okay. Currently, Alabama is Republican, state level. Okay. Florida is Republican on the state level. This is a little known fact, I bet you didn't know this. The ratio of Republican to Democrat right now in the United States is 27 Republican on the state level, 23 Democrat. So right now on the state level, when it applies to reapportionment or the redrawing of lines, the advantage, and believe me, Republicans and Democrats, they look at this as a game. Who has the upper hand? Right now on the federal level, the Democrats have the upper hand, right? Right? They're going to have the President, they're going to have the Senate, and they're going to have the House for at least two years. Till 2022, November of 2022, at least. But on the state level, the Republicans have the advantage. Long term, if you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, what does that mean, Mr. Crane? Long term, advantage Republicans. Because a lot happens on the state level, which impacts what happens in Washington, D.C. So, you look at the numbers, get into the numbers, state level, Republicans have the advantage, which will help them in 2022 and will help them in 2024. Okay, number 30 and 31. Um, well, let's do 30. James, I'm going to give this to you. What is gerrymandering? Go ahead and highlight this one, okay? Go ahead and highlight gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the process of, oh, the process of redrawing legislative ground boundaries for the purpose of benefiting the political party. Okay. I want you to, I want you to write this word right behind or right beside somewhere on number 30. Illegal. Okay? You cannot do this. Gerrymandering is... Illegal. Now, there are some legal loopholes, I'm not going to get into that, but there are some legal loopholes that Republican and Democrats try to jump through to redraw lines to benefit them. You can't draw lines in a state only to benefit you. You can't do that. Now, 
Have Republicans and Democrats in certain states tried that? Absolutely. And there's three ways that they can do this, all right? This is what I want you to highlight, all right? And when I show you pictures, if you turn in your book to page 284, page 284 at the bottom, there are pictures for wasted vote, excess vote, and stacked vote. So you can see visuals of what this looks like. So let's look at these real quick. Wasted vote. The idea says it spreads out opposition supporters across many districts, but in a minority. All right, so what does minority mean? If, if you have 10 people, what is a minority? What could a minority be out of 10 people? Say again? Yeah, less than five. So six to four, seven to three, eight to two, nine to one, ten to zero, right? Those are majority, or those are minority. So take a look on page 284 at wasted vote, okay? You have five districts. Now the party in power, whoever it is, they spread votes out in two, three, four, and five. They spread red votes out in two, three, four, and five. But in all four of those districts, the red is always gonna come up a little short. Six to four, seven to three, eight to two, they're always gonna come up a little short. The party in blue will win out of those five districts because there's only one district where red has the majority. So when you spread out, votes across districts to ensure that they have the minority, that's what's called wasted vote. Now let's look at excess right next to it. Excess says concentrates opposition voters into a few districts. So excess vote is the exact opposite of wasted. Wasted is you're spreading them out. What are you doing with excess? You're clustering them. That's, that's a great way to think you're clustering them into one or two districts. Take a look at this, okay? First of all, in excess vote, in the second little box, who's the party in power? The red, right? Where, what district have they clustered the blue votes? Three. Three, so in district three, district three goes blue, but then all of the other districts are now red. All right, let's take a look at the last one, stack vote. This is the weirdest of the three. Stack vote says the idea links district areas of like-minded voters through odd-shaped boundaries. Yes, state legislatures can do this. Check out box number three, stack vote. Look how weird shape these districts are. Check out the box. Number three, okay? That's a little different shape than wasted vote and excess vote. Excess and wasted vote are usually more standard shape. But in stack vote, they'll create different shapes and sizes to get the voters that they want in the appropriate areas or regions. Stack vote, who is the party in power here based on what you see, Rachel? Um, red. Red is, yep. But you see how odd shaped the blue district is, number three? See how weird that is? Um, so you have the three types of gerrymandering. All of these are illegal, by the way. All of these are illegal. You cannot redraw states' lines to benefit one party. You can't do that. Both parties have to be involved in that. All right. Last question here, I'll give this to Steph. How is gerrymandering combined with ethnicity for political use? The idea is that they stop vote gerrymandering is a practice for creating certain districts that are inclined to elect ethnic minorities by creating an ethnic district that ensures ethnic candidates election by the people of that district. Okay, very 
very good. Um, how many of you have heard of a lady? Well, first of all, let me back up real quick. How many of you know, you've heard of the U.S. House of Representatives? You've heard of that, okay? Over the past couple years, prior to the 2020 election, there were four ladies, very liberal, very progressive, many people have called them socialists. I don't know that, but they're very liberal, they're very progressive. Four ladies, they've been labeled the squad. Have you heard of these ladies? The squad, okay? One of the ladies in the squad is a, uh, is, she's a practicing Muslim. Um, her name is Olan, Ilan Omar. Have you heard of, of her representative, Ilan Omar of Minnesota? Okay, her district is, the capital of Minnesota is St. Paul. The two largest cities in Minnesota are St. Paul and Minneapolis. They're right across the river from one another. Well, her district, um, Ilan Omar's district, is in downtown Minneapolis. Very interesting is the redrawing of lines. The district that elected her, I don't know if you know this about uh, Representative Omar, but she is Somalian by birth. She was born and raised in Somalia, came to the United States. Practicing Muslim. Guess who the district elected her is made up primarily of in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, Somalians. So see, this happens, ethnicity, certain people, minorities, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're black, whether they're white, certain districts in this country, especially in the inner city, will elect people of the same ethnicity or the same race to represent and this happens all across our country. Does anybody know how many people, how many representatives are in our United States House of Representatives? Does anybody know that number? 435. 435 representatives. And many of those people come from the inner city where you see ethnicity playing a major role. All right, let's flip the page and let's Move on. All right, go ahead and highlight uh, that question there. Jackson, what's that question say for us, key issue four? Why do states operate and compete with each other? Yes, all right. How many of you like to compete? How many of you that are friends outside of school like to compete with each other? Okay, we all like to compete. States compete, states want to win, countries want to win. So let's talk about some of this. Number one, why is the idea of two superpowers a relatively new one? Who wants to take this one? Steph? Yeah, All right, I want you to highlight that. The first two superpowers of the world were the United States and the Soviet Union. Those were the first two superpowers. Who would you say the two superpowers are today? Curious. There are two superpowers today. Who do you think they are? Yeah. China and the US. China and the US. If you were to say in the 21st century, 2021, it would be China and the US. All right, number two. You want to highlight this. What's the balance of power? Logan? A condition of roughly equal strength between opposing line states. Okay, good. Um, does the U.S. have enemies today? Yes. Okay, who would you say some of our enemies are today? I'm hearing, say it a little louder. Iran, did I hear Iran? Okay, yeah, Iran. Do we have a balance of power with Iran? Think about that carefully. What's the definition? Balance of power is the idea of equal strength between opposing alliances. Is Iran equal to us? No. no. Balance of power isn't even, a, isn't even a thought. Who's another enemy of the United States? Syria. Syria? Do we have a balance of power with Syria? We blow Syria out of, out of the water, right? 
with our with our military. There probably would only be one enemy today that you could say would come anywhere near a balance of power with the United States, and that would be China. China. Okay. China. Because of their million-man army, the technology that they're you know improving in space, um, but still, they're nowhere near the military capability of the United States. That's why the Chinese regularly try to get spies into the United States to steal our military secrets, just like the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. China knows they're behind, so they want to do what cheaters do and cheat to get that information from the U.S., send it back to Beijing, and hopefully use that against the U.S. Number three, describe the purpose of NATO. Kat, what did you have for number three? NATO was a military alliance of 16 democratic states and dividing the United States and Canada that sought to prevent the Soviet Union from overwhelming and conquering smaller countries. Good, very good. NATO was, it still does exist today technically, but NATO was very important during World War II. Um, how about the Warsaw Pact? Peyton, what did you have for the Warsaw Pact? The communist countries sought to defend each other in case of attack by NATO powers to provide this Soviet Union with buffer states between it and Germany. Okay, good. Let me ask you this. So, do you understand what an alliance is? What is an alliance? First of all, I guess I should back up. Within political geography, the idea of an alliance is very important. So, what what is that? What is that? I guess a temporary peace with another country. Okay, temporary peace with another country. Okay, any other ideas? Kind of like an agreement that they won't start war with each other. Like, I won't start war with you if you don't start war with me. Exactly. How many of you, how many of you have heard over the past month, the last month of President Trump's presidency, and, and he's had a lot to do with it, how many of you have heard of the new alliances that Israel has made with several of the Middle East countries? Have you heard about that? That they'll increase trade, they'll increase travel, okay? That's a great modern day example of political geography and alliance. There are now flights that go from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi, okay, in the United Arab Emirates. That never happened before until about a month ago. So those are great real-life examples of what an alliance would be. Typically, alliances are economic, they're political, or they're to keep you out of a conflict. All right, so number five, when was the European Union formed? Jackson? 1958. 1958. Circle that date. The European Union still exists today. A little trivia for you to see if you're paying attention to current events. What country just officially backed out of the European Union? The United Kingdom. Not the United Kingdom, country. England. Yes, England did, right. And that, that movement was called Brexit. I remember hearing that. Um, but they backed out of the European Union as well. All right, number six. Um, what states were a part of the European Union? Number six. Logan, can you take that one? Um, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, West Germany. Okay, so obviously West Germany doesn't exist anymore, right? Because after communism fell, East Germany and West Germany came back together in the early 1990s. And I will say the European Union is much larger now. But, in 1958, how many countries is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. There are only six countries originally in the European Union. Now that's grown to over 30 plus countries. So there's a lot more countries in the European Union. Does anybody know the primary purpose of the European Union? Is it political? Is it social? Is it economic? Is it military? What's the primary purpose? Yeah. Um. To heal and rebuild Western Europe economically after World War II. Yeah, and I, I probably just asked too much question, didn't I? I just realized that. 
um, the answer even deeper than that and what um, Kat read is exactly right, it's economic. You might want to just add that to number seven. The, the purpose of the, uh, the European Union is economic, is to have more countries working together for the betterment of the European economy. That's really what it was. If you know anything about World War II, you know that it was an extremely devastating war. Tens of millions of people lost their life. Entire countries were devastated. In the middle of the 1940s, if you looked at Europe, it was unrecognizable because there were bodies strewn all over Europe. The stench was horrific. Disease was prevalent and buildings were just gone. They were destroyed. So we needed this organization to come along to be developed to help with that. All right, um, number eight, what are some important changes in recent years? Uh, Ginger, number eight. I feel like they removed the barrier for um, free trade and now they have a parliament and subsidies. Um, okay, yep, that's handouts to people. All right, go ahead and start number eight. All right, free trade, does everybody understand what free trade is? You know what free trade? Free trade means that um, you can trade with other countries. There's no restrictions. For example, if um, you wanted to trade with your friend next door, free trade would say you could walk out of your door, your friend could walk out of your door next door, you could meet somewhere in the front yard, and you could, you could uh, give him $10, and he would give you two baseball cards or two bags of water. Right? That's free trade. Now, non-free trade would be if you wanted to walk out your door and your mom or dad said, you're not going anywhere. Stay in here. You're not going out there. All right, that's an obstacle to free trade. You can't go out and meet your friend to trade that item for the money with that friend. All right, so free trade is just saying, I'm going to trade coffee with you. I want your coffee. Will you give me your apples and oranges? Okay, that's free trade. And that happens all over the world. Um, have any of you before the whole COVID thing? Probably not, because you're, you're freshmen, but there are many of the trips that Mr. Stokey used to take kids on, the leadership trips, when they went to Europe, they had to have euros. Euro is a currency that is used all across um, Europe today. And, and that was something that played. Um, okay, number nine, um, the Eurozone crisis. I'll just read this. Put, put a little star by this. Um, they created a single bank, the European, European Central Bank. Uh, creates a common cur cur uh, currency, the Euro, economically weaker. European countries have been forced to implement harsh policies since the early 2000s. Uh, economically stronger countries have been forced to subsidize. That basically means to give a handout, to give money, um, kind of like a loan. Do any of you have younger brothers or sisters? Okay. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a family vacation. When I was little, my mom and dad would always give, I have a younger sister, three years younger than me. Whenever we'd go on a family vacation, my mom and dad would usually give my sister and I like, on little things if, if we would see it. Well, my sister, being the spender that she is, would always, and I more of a saver, my sister would run out of money um, a lot sooner than I would. And I, she would always come to me and say, you know, can I have five dollars? I see something that I want. And so the idea of a subsidy is you give them that money but then you know that you're going to get that back. Um, and I would always make sure that my mom or dad was present. I would say, now, I have a witness here that is seeing me give you the money. I expect that I get this money back. You know, and my mom and dad always made sure that happened. So that's the idea of subsidy. In Europe, there are strong countries economically. There are weak countries. So 
Um, the stronger companies usually have to bail out the weaker. Now, let me just say this, okay? Let me say why this is very important for you, all right? And um, let, let me just say this. Immigration, I want to go back to immigration. This is why you don't want illegal immigrants coming into the country. Because you are of the age where many of the illegal immigrants that are coming into this country, you are going to be competing with those people for jobs. So the, the fewer people that come into this country illegally, the more positive for you because you're finishing high school in the next four years. Then you have four, five, six years of college, depending on if you get a master's or a PhD, or go on to med school or law school. You want an even playing field. And so there's always going to be stronger people, more wealthier people, and there's going to be poorer people. Um, you know, and so there's just something to think about. We will finish tomorrow. We have some big charts to go through, but um, stopping at 10 is a good place. It won't take us the whole period tomorrow, uh, which is good. Um, so I'll have a couple other um, things to go over tomorrow. But remember, on Thursday, Please, please bring your colored pencils. I will have the paper for you, but please bring your colored pencils. Because Thursday will be a time for you to show me what you have learned when you're doing your content. Enjoy your lunch.